Hello, this is Randy Wilt, and uh, today I'm going to talk just briefly about understanding Christian art symbolism. However, a better way, a way I prefer to actually say it would be more like, what is the understanding the symbolism of Christian art? You may say, what's the difference? Well, when you're trying to understand the symbolism, you have to look at the art, see the symbolism, and then through your own knowledge, you can determine what the picture's all about. You do that through clues in the picture and from the story that you can determine from your own knowledge. So let's kind of go through here. But first, I want to kind of show you a couple things here. This is probably the most popular picture ever, the most famous picture ever painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Sometimes between 1503 and 1519, the Mona Lisa, people say it's the most perfect picture. They can see all types of different things in there. They talk about her smile. I'm not going to try to explain this picture because I want to make it kind of clear here is that, you know, I have a, a, a doctor, I have a PhD, but it's not in art history, it's not in uh, art, it's actually in cultural communications. But that's how I got interested. Because when you study cultural communications, you look at artifacts. You look at artifacts of the culture. So, for example, if you went to New York City, you, you see the Empire State Building. That's something that, when you see it, you know it is New York City. Same thing when you look at art. You can see different artifacts in there. Mona Lisa, I can't really understand it. You probably can but as we get through some of the religious art, it's going to make more sense to you. Second thing is, is that I have a master's of theology, but it's not, again, in any type of Christian artwork. It's in the second century church. And what made me fascinated is that when you get into the second century church and then the third century and fourth century, that's when you're studying a lot about the church fathers. People like Ignatius, uh, Arrhenius, uh, you got Jerome, Augustine, Ambrose, they just, the, the line goes on and on and on. And you start seeing these people popping up into the Christian artwork. And how do you know one from the other? You know, when you see a picture of Christ, you pretty much know it's Christ. If you see a picture of Mary, of a woman holding a baby, it could be the Madonna in Christ. But you see a picture of an old man holding a book, who is that? Is that Ambrose? Is it Jerome? Uh, is it St. Patrick? Who is it? So that's the other thing. Not only did I get interested because I've studied the different church fathers, but also the artifacts that you see in those. But sometimes people read too much into it, just like the Mona Lisa here. I've heard people talk about all the things you're reading into it. And then there's the second most popular picture ever painted, they say, is Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh. 1889, and people look at that and they say, oh my goodness, look at all the symbolism in here. This means this, this means that. And uh, Vincent uh, uh, Van Gogh actually wrote his brother Theo on around the 20th of September. Remember, this was painted in June, saying that it was just a study of night. It was a night study. There was no symbolism there. He didn't see anything into it. He said, I just, I just painted something that I saw in the night sky. So here's a case where sometimes people overdo it. They overbuild in the symbolism when actually the artist didn't have it in there. And then there's this one here. This is by far not one of the top arts in the world. Uh, Marden painted this in 1968. I actually saw this at the Blanton Museum at University of Texas. Uh, it's called Fave. And maybe you've heard about it. I, when I looked at it, I looked at it and thought, I don't understand what it is. Uh, this is a case where the artist has a meaning, but the viewers cannot figure it out. And as I looked at it, I thought, I don't get it. It looks like a beige side and a gray side. I don't get it. And I had to read what the artist actually said. And the artist said that there is a tension between the colors. Okay, at that point, I started to understand. Not that, once again, I'm an art critic by no means, but I do understand that gray is a cool color and the beige is a warm color. It's a tension between warm and cool in the colors. Okay, that made sense to me, but someone had to tell me, and thank goodness the artist put it in there, or whoever the curator was put it in there, what the artist said. Now, before we get into looking at the actual artworks, I wanted to kind of explain to you also about the symbolism and how it can go to many different directions. I'm going to give you some history here that will help you to kind of have a better idea. And the history I'm going to do is take you back to two dictionaries. The first one was written by Samuel Johnson in England, British. It's called the British Dictionary, 
1755, and the other one was written by Noah Webster, not to be confused with Daniel. Noah Webster, he wrote the American Dictionary in 1806. Now, Samuel Johnson, who wrote the first official British dictionary, this is before the Oxford Dictionary, which came out in 1886 or so. Samuel Johnson went in there and he took all the different words he could find in the British language. He asked different people what it meant. And so, as he found out different meanings, he would write them down. And he found very quickly that the same word could mean three, four, five different things. Now, Noah Webster was a little bit different. Noah Webster, he said, we are now a country of our own. America is no longer part of Britain. We need to have our own language. That's one reason why the biggest thing Noah did is that he changed a lot of the spelling. So if you're in England, you see color, C-O-L-O-U-R. We're here, we're C-O-L-O-R. For them, uh, check would be C-H-E-Q-U-E. For us, is C-H-E-C-K. So Noah goes in there and he says, you know, we're going to replace some of this spelling. We're going to have the American spelling of the English language. But also, he said, this is a bunch of silliness that we have multiple meanings that go all over the board. He said, a meaning should be, you can have multiple meanings, but they need to be all fairly similar. They need to be somehow related to it. So that's what he did. And then, like I said, in uh, 1884, you have the Oxford Dictionary. The guy's name was James Murray. There's a movie called The Professor and the Madman. And here's a picture of the Oxford Dictionary. All the reason why I want to show this to you is because, remember, James Murray followed the case of uh, Samuel Adams. I'm sorry, Samuel Johnson, by saying put every meaning in the world in here. And what he actually did is see that little card up there. He went all the book uh, sellers and put that card into the books and told people write a word and give me your definition. And he put them all into it. In this Oxford Dictionary, if you were to buy it today, which you can, and you actually got the full case uh, covering for it, you have a magnifying glass included because you can see how small it is. That book is not any larger than a typical book is. So, and of course, like it says in here, Noah Webster uh, actually ended up, when he passed away, George, Mer George Merriam and Charles Merriam bought the rights and renamed it to what we know today, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Now, let's take one word in particular, and you're going to understand what I'm, how I'm trying to get this into the symbolism. But let's take one word, and that word is smart. So, the question is, now you sound smart. Someone says you are smart. Well, what does smart mean? Well, if you look at it in the American sense, smart means intelligent. Someone says you are smart. That means you are intelligent. But if you look at it, the Samuel Johnson, the Oxford Dictionary, the British style, it means a sharp pain. It can mean a fancy dress or fancy appearance, or it can mean a quip or a witty comment. Now, you can see what I was talking about a moment ago. These three are not related at all. Uh, you could say intelligent, knowledgeable, but over here in the British, you got three complete different definitions. And I remember hearing this while I was growing up, a sharp pain. I've never in my life used the phrase, you, you're a smart dresser, uh, meaning your fancy dress. And when I've been in uh, London, I've made a comment and people said that's a smart comment and i thought there is nothing intelligent about what i just said and i realized no they're talking about it was a quip or a witty comment so smart can mean different things now let's look at the word red red is interesting because red is all through the christian art world and what does red mean look at the, some of the definitions over here passion confidence strength energy uh, action power down to attention and strength so when you see something red, what does it mean? When you see that red rose, does that red rose mean courage? No, it probably means more like passion on there. So red is a good example of where all of a sudden one word can take on a bunch of different meanings based upon the context you see it in. Same thing like that word smart. Now I'm going to give you the example here. In this example is, I'm not going to try to say the artist's name, but it was in 1967. Uh, he created this. I've actually seen the yellow one. The yellow one is at the Blanton Museum. But what he did, he said, of greatest sensation is the edge of everything. And I read this. I couldn't figure out what he was talking about until I realized that what he was trying to do was sit there and say, your colors meet. 
So if you look at the far right, you see the green to the blue to the yellow. So those are all complementary colors. The gray and the red are not complementary colors. Now, I'm not smart enough to explain to you exactly what he was trying to get across when he did this, but here you have a case where you have an interpretation that some people actually can figure out. You know, I guess some of us, like me, I cannot figure it out. Why did I get interested in all this? I got interested because I've been to Oxford, England many times. I've been to the Ashmolin Museum. And the Ashmolin is probably, I think, one of the greatest museums in the world because they have a bunch of different things going all the way back to Ro the Roman eras. And on the early Italian art floor, the galleries of early Italian, uh, they have all these different types of great Christian uh, art with symbolism. And I had a docent. Now, a docent is basically a, a very informed uh, person, like a curator. And he was explaining to me about some of the symbolism in Christian art. So this piqued my interest. And from there, I kept going further. And actually, what you're going to see here is I'm going to be showing you pictures of what I took at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., because they actually, at the Museum of the Bible, have all these pictures. And I'm not going to take any credit at all for saying that I interpreted these, but instead they interpreted them. And I wrote it down, took the pictures, and came back inside to create this PowerPoint. So I'm taking no credit for it, but this is from an exhibit at the Museum of the Bible. But my docent at the Eshmolin uh, Museum showed a picture, and this is what really perked me up, and this is the picture. Now, I looked at it, and of course, you can't really see the title of it, but I looked at this picture, and he was telling us, he said, there is so much symbolism in here that it's hard to understand what's going on. I see people in pain. I see people laying down. Uh, I see uh, some scholars over here in the black. I see people staying around in red, green, blue, yellow, uh, white. Uh, on the column here, I see someone who looks like a wise person, but there it looks like someone with a horn is behind, whispering his, his ear. A lot of people misinterpret it. They think this is Christ up there talking to the people, and that is Satan trying to tempt him. Okay, that's not the case at all. What it is, this is called the Sermon of the Deeds of the Antichrist by Signorelli. And it's painted between 1499 and 1504. And that is not Christ. That is the Antichrist. And the reason why we know that is because Satan, who's whispering in his ear, has his arm in the sleeve of the Antichrist. You see that? So you see the Antichrist's right hand arm, but you don't see the left. But instead, you see Satan, which you have to read that as they are tied together. They are bound together. They are, I'm not going to say they're one, but they're the same. You know, they, they're trying to accomplish the same thing. And when you look at the people down here, you look at some of these expressions. And the way the docent was explaining it to me, he said, as you go through and you start understanding more about colors and about what people are doing, their expressions, it starts telling you all of a sudden what is going on in these pictures. And then you understand what the artist is trying to say without the artist actually lining it out for you. So let's start now looking at some of the actual religious artwork. So understanding the symbolism of Christian art, there's three ways we do it. We do it through clues, we do it through the story, and we do it through a picture book. And the picture book is, of course, the whole image. So every image has got clues into it. Uh, there's a story behind it. Now, the question is, can you determine the story or do you already know the story? Do those clues help you to understand the story or do the clues just ratify what you've already known about it? And then the overall picture. So the first picture I want to show you, once again, this came out of the gallery at the Museum of the Bible. And this actual uh, exhibit goes through September of 2020. And then I guess it's going to move somewhere else. And they actually show these pictures with what you're seeing here beside. And it helped me to understand how you interpret the symbolism, how it helps you to interpret what the artist is trying to say to you. So here we got the picture of the Holy Trinity. And now we're seeing where the years 1392 to 1412, uh, sometime within there, sometimes is actually the date that the uh, artists live. But in this case, they think it was painted sometime between there. What are the clues? The clues, first of all, is that we see some identical figures. We see the cross, we see the dove. What's the story? Well, this is a classic uh, scene that we see quite often where you see the Father, you see the Son on the cross, and you see the Dove as the Holy Spirit. Now, what does the picture tell us here? What you're seeing here is you're seeing the Father, 
and the Son identical. What is that telling you? It shows you also that they're connected to each other, and the Holy Spirit is above Christ's head, but he's right at the heart of the Father, the Father's heart. Now, what the artist is trying to say here to us is that Christ and the Father are the same. And this goes back to some of the heresy that was going through at the time where they said the Father created the Son, and the Son was subordinate to the Father. That was a heresy. That was Arius. Um, that was a heresy that we pushed out with the uh, Nicaea um, Code uh, that said that the Father did not create the Son that they are of the same substance, not similar substance. So this picture here is basically saying Christ and the Father are one and the same. One God, three Godheads. Okay. Now moving along here, let's look at this next picture, Madonna and Child. Now, <clears throat> this is going to get a little bit more into what we can understand. The last picture is a little difficult to try to interpret, but this is now where you start paying attention. hope you were paying attention anyhow. For example, the clues here, red, blue, green, white fabric. We see a halo. What does a halo mean? We mean that means that they're holy. Okay. It's interesting how we see two different types of halos. We don't know why in this case here. So what does a red signify? The red signifies either love or hate. Now, in religious artwork, we pretty much think it always has to do with love. But you remember that one of the Antichrist? You saw some red in there. Remember, the Antichrist was actually wearing red. In that case, we had to interpret that red on the Antichrist as being hate not love. Okay, red also shows the deep love for Jesus, the deep love for Christ. You'll see different people we'll talk about who are wearing red, which reflects when you see that it means they have a deep love for Christ. Also signifies the earth. It says here sometimes blood, but you don't see it as much. But always remember when you see red, that signifies the earth, whereas blue is the color of heaven and truth. When you see blue, it represents heaven. White represents purity and innocence, and green represents springtime, represents something new growing. It represents the triumph of life over death, or let's just say it represents the resurrection. So when you see green, it's the resurrection. So let's interpret the picture for a second here. Christ is wearing white. Uh, purity. He's standing on the green pillow, which is, it signifies that he will be resurrected. It's the resurrection coming. We see Mary wearing blue on the outside, red on the inside. Always pay attention to where these colors are. So red refers to that she was born of the earth, but the blue means but that she is heavenly. Not that she is God, like we may people say the mother of God, but this says that she has heaven, you know, as part of her. So Heavily is the best way to actually put that. And we're going to see some different symbolism. Now, here we see John the Evangelist. This, of course, this is John the Beloved. Uh, he was a disciple, not to be confused with John the Baptist. Now, where are the clues here? Eagle, the inkwell, the quill, the book, the red, and the green fabric. Okay, we always see John wearing red. And he's associated with red. And the eagle there is very interesting because we hear that in Revelation that when John wrote, there are four creatures. Arrhenius and Jerome also later, these are church fathers, assigned the eagle to him, that that represented John. So when you see something where there's an eagle, that represents John, particularly when John's in the picture. An eagle by itself? No, it does not. That doesn't mean John's in the picture. John has to be there with the eagle. Next thing, the book, the inkwell, he wrote Revelation. He wrote the Gospel of John. He was a writer. And of course, uh, he always wears red. And he wears white, the purity, and also earthly in his love for Christ. Now, let's get a little bit more complicated. Here's St. Mary Magdalene. Sometime in the 16th or 17th century, we don't know exactly who uh, painted this. Where are the clues? We see long blonde hair. We see rich looking fabrics. And now here's a skull down here. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting because there's a lot of interpretations about Mary. Some people say that uh, she was a prostitute. Some people say that she was the one uh, that uh, washed uh, Christ's feet with the perfumes. Uh, some people say she was not. 
this particular artist went in there and said those were not true. They, she, they actually sat there and said that Pope Gregory I conflated Mary by introducing in Luke 8, 2 that she was the sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet, you know. And the Pope uh, Gregory, he did this and convinced, I guess, the population to believe that. And maybe it is. Maybe he knew something we did not know, or maybe not. But this artist, unfortunately we don't know who it is, painted Mary differently. So what did she do? Or what did he do? He painted her with silk and velvet clothing, which represents wealth. So Mary was, according to him, a wealthy person. The skull, the skull represents death, but she's looking away from it. So she's looking away from death. That tells you that she believes in the resurrection. She believes in the salvation. And she has long blonde hair. And the long blonde hair represents repentance. That she goes from despair to hope. Now, when I first looked at this, I thought it looked like long red hair. But it's actually long blonde hair. Long red hair refers to someone who is wild. That's why some of the pictures of David, you know, David who's slain. Goliath has wild red hair because he was wild, he had a wild spirit. Mary had a long blonde hair. Blonde refers to despair, to hope. Now, another picture here, this is a St. Veronica. Now, St. Veronica is not in the Bible. If you know the story, St. Veronica, she, the, the legend says, by tradition, that when Christ was carrying the cross and he fell down, that she reached over and she took her, her veil, her white veil, and she wiped his brow with them, with, uh, with the veil. So what do you see in this picture here? Well, we see a few things. We see, first of all, Christ's picture on the veil. That's because she wiped his brow with it. Uh, we see red. We see green. We see some rich colors in there. Um, you know, so, yeah, there's some interesting colors that tells us a whole lot about her. There's some stuff in the background, too. So red tells us her love for Christ tells the earthly. The green tells us about the passion of her, I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, not the passion, about the resurrection. That tells us that she believes in the resurrection. She shows rich fabric, which means that the, the artist thought that she has some wealth behind her, and then, of course, the imprint of Christ on the veil. Now, here's a picture. We talked about John the Beloved. Now, we talk about John the Baptist in the wilderness. And this picture here is interesting. Now, most of the artists, when they drew pictures of John, they would show him as a young adolescent. And they would try to show things that resemble that he was, you know, the forerunner of Christ. So there's some clues and some pictures here. So let's see if we can identify some of those. So we have a red cloth drape. We have a lamb. We have the cross. We have the mountains. We have an animal skin. Okay, all these things tell us that this is John the Baptist. So if you were to see this picture... And you didn't see that it says St. John the Baptist in the wilderness, but you saw the picture. You could probably piece it together by looking at these different artifacts, these different components. Uh, the lamb represents what? Le represents Christ, the Lamb of God. Uh, the staff, the, it's hard to see. The very top, there's a cross up there. Okay, the red represents his passion, his love for Christ. It's kind of hard to see in here, but there is, if you saw the picture up close, you could see that there is uh, the animal skin, which represents that, you know, he was in the wilderness. And, of course, the mountains in the background. Okay, we have so far gone through about half the pictures here, and we've talked about some of the different elements, symbolism. Let's see how well you know it. So we're going to test your knowledge, and we're going to do our uh, midterm exam here on the Madonna and the Child. So in the midterm exam, I want you to look at this picture. This is one I started very first with. And I want you to see if you can tell me what's going on in this picture, who these people are, what those colors represent. So think about that. Let's take a look at it. Okay, I knew you couldn't do it. Uh, the reason why is because we haven't covered that much. You, you can figure out the red and the white, and, and the, the, that's actually blue, not black. But what's that weird animal down there? Uh, why do we have different hats on? Uh, so, I mean, there's, okay, let's talk about some of those items. So, let's get back to that. But first, let's talk about St. Jerome. Now, here is St. Jerome. Who is he? He's one of our church fathers born in the 4th century in Stridon, which is now the Balkans today. 
he uh, wrote the Bible. He was the one who took and revised the Latin text into what we call the Vulgate. So here we see a book. We see a skull. We see him looking up toward heaven away from the skull. We see an hourglass. It's kind of new to us. We see green clothing, but we see a red robe. And over there in the corner, we see a red hat, and we see this lion, this animal in the background. How weird. So what does all this mean? The book reflects its writing of the Vulgate. The skull, the skull always represents death. When you see a skull, death is involved somehow. But Jerome is looking away from the skull, which means he is looking away from death. He's looking toward heaven saying basically that, you know, death wears thy sting. I mean, I probably didn't quote that quite right, but he's looking toward heaven. Hourglass. Hourglass is interesting. Uh, hourglass in religious art means the resurrection. That means something to do with the resurrection. So anytime you see an hourglass and you're sitting there and you see a picture of a, one of the popes, you see the hourglass on the table, you see a lantern. We'll talk about the lantern in a moment. Hourglass means that... You know, the, he believes in the resurrection. Same thing with that green cloth. He's wearing a green outfit. And that means he believes that you must be born again, the resurrection. The red robe is interesting because what does red mean? It means earthly. It means the love for Christ. It means, you know, uh, blood, all these different things. But in his case, it's kind of interesting because that red robe is a sign of his position in the church. And the way we know that is because of that red hat in the top left corner. That is a cardinal's hat. So he is a cardinal in the church. And at this time, we basically were the Catholic Church. So he was, quote, the cardinal in the Catholic Church. He lived much earlier, but I'm talking about when the painting was done. The line is interesting. Tradition says that St. Jerome removed a thorn from the lion's paw, and the lion stayed to protect him forever and ever. I thought it was a mouse myself. I thought a mouse removed the thorn, but I guess I was wrong. Maybe it was St. Jerome. Uh, but anyhow, that was the tradition, in that he had a line that always was around protecting him. So this is, again, how we know is Jerome. So a person, if you see a person with a red cape and a red hat and a lion, hey, that's going to be St. Jerome. Now let's look at another person here. Now we got St. Augustine. Now if you know the story of St. Augustine, he was not a very good guy when he was uh, young. He, he sinned. He did everything that any sinner could do. And then he converts uh, to Christianity. And he writes a book. That's, he writes a whole bunch. But he writes this thing called the Confession. And later he becomes the bishop, Bishop of Hippo. <clears throat> so when you look at this here, let's look at a couple things here. We're just looking at, at uh, St. Augustine right now. He's the one that is wearing the gold robe. He has the mitre, that's the cap. And then he uh, is uh, carrying a book with him. The mitre is the representation of a bishop. The gold robe represents a bishop too. If that robe was white, it would be the pope. The mitre would be solid white too, but because the mitre has some gold on it and he has a gold robe with some burgundy, the key there is gold and burgundy, then he's going to be a bishop. What's that book doing there? That book is because he wrote, he wrote lots. He wrote the confession. And then he saw in this heart, which is called the bleeding heart. And this has several different meanings to it. Uh, it could be about the passion of Christ. It could refer to his bleeding because this is the heart of Christ that was pierced by a uh, spear. Uh, or it could be that you're leaving your sins behind, your old life behind as you take on the new life. Okay, so here we got a picture of St. Uh, Augustine. Now this is interesting. <clears throat> I'm going to bring out some things here that probably you have not seen before. And this is called the mocking of Christ. So we see some, let's just look at some of the items here. We see Christ. We see the red cloak. Here we see someone with a yellow shirt. We see helmet. We see armor. We see the armor glove. And then in the far right corner, we see this round hat with a feather. What does all this mean to it? Well, the cloak is earthly because Christ is on earth. This represents that he's being treated earthly, basically. The yellow is something interesting. When you see yellow in religious art, 
It doesn't always mean this, but most of the time it means that there is some hostility involved. There's mocking involved, or there could be jealousy. And that's why you're seeing this person to the right wearing the yellow helmet and the armor that represents soldiers, even though probably not the type of armor they wore back then, but it probably was when the thing was Spain in the 1600s. And what you see, those two soldiers, actually there's four soldiers, by the way. You see the one to the right with the yellow and you see the helmet. But you see the two ones who are actually mocking, they their, look like they're, they're uh, uh, stabbing Jesus with these uh, rods. The one on the left, uh, he's very determined looking. But the one on the right has a melancholy look about him, like he's not sure about this here. So the artist is trying to say is that, you know, they're not, not everybody was sure. Not all the, the soldiers are sure that what they were doing was correct. And because he's wearing the armor glove would represent that he is the superior of the other soldier. And one of the best things I love about this picture is the round hat. And that hat back there with a feather in the right hand corner, that is called a Tudor bonnet. And that goes back to Henry VIII, which was Henry VIII, it was around 1500s. And he was Henry VIII, he was a Tudor. And they had these type of hats. <clears throat> now, that hat has gone through the years. And nowadays, if you see that hat, it, it's typically worn by a woman, a female, who's got a doctorate degree. Instead of wearing uh, <clears throat> the other type of hats, like we typically wear the four-corner, six-corner hats, they wear what we call the tuner bonnet. So anytime you see the bonnet, in these pictures, particularly after 1500s, it represents academics or education. Now look at this guy's face. He has a startled, uh, amazed uh, look on his face, which says that academically, educationally, this is concerning. This doesn't make sense. So that's what the artist is trying to communicate here, is that you've got soldiers, some are determined, some are confused, some are have melancholy. You've got some that are mocking Jesus. You got one back over here next to the artist, I mean, next to the bonnet hat, who he looks sorrowful. Then you got the academic, which is questioning what is going on here. So you can see there's a lot of meaning in that. Next picture we're gonna look at is the Magi. Now, the only thing I really wanna point out here to you is that here's a case where you have a bunch of different stories and they don't all make total sense <clears throat> if you, unless you actually dissect them down. And then you have to kind of piece it together. So, for example, you've got, is it, how many Magi's do we have? Do we have three or do we have four? Do we have three with the one with the gold cape? Is that the servant in the back or is that fourth Magi? Well, I'm sure it's probably three Magi's. Now, look at what's going on here with the different moods. Christ looks, he's leaning toward, away from Mary, toward the Magi. You know, Mary's allowing that. What is Joseph doing, kind of pointing down? Look at the angels up there. They're kind of frolicking. They're, they're, they're happy about all this, you know. So there's a scene, there's a story up there going on with the angels. There's a story with the Magi. There's a story with the Holy Family. Then come over here to the far left. And you see, interesting, you see soldiers. Um, you see horses. You see the bellowing flags. Uh, this is interesting. The flags are flying, but then, you know, in the wind, but then the capes of the Magi's are not. So what's going on with those flags? Look how the horse looks a little distraught. The horse is not, I mean, look where the leg is. But then to, to come over here and look at this cow. What is this cow doing on the far right side? He's looking down. Uh, he's looking down very like an adoration. So lots of different scenes are going on there. Now, take a look at this here. There's a bunch of different things going on in this picture here. But the main thing is we've got John, we've got Mary, Mary Magdalene. We have the color yellow. We have a skull. And we have Christ doing something with his hand. So John the Beloved, he's over there wearing his typical red. That's how we know it's John. So it's John. Mary's wearing her customary blue, which is truth or heaven. And she's got her white veil, which is purity. Mary Magdalene, she's wearing green. Now, this is interesting <clears throat> because she's wearing green which is a sign of the resurrection, but Christ is being crucified. So we're going to talk about this after a while, about, about that. You've got some soldiers back there. You've got two of the soldiers wearing yellow, one wearing red. So that tells you that you've got one soldier who, you know, maybe has a passion for the Lord. The other two do not. Who knows? You see the skull down there. In this case, the skull is not death. The skull re represents the location, which is Golgotha. 
And noteworthy, like I say here, if you look at Christ's right hand, which is the top left-hand corner, he's giving the blessing symbol, which is basically two fingers out, two fingers pulled back. That's a blessing which could be, Father, forgive them. They know not what they've done. Moving along here, now we're back to St. Jerome again. Remember him? This time he's looking at the skull. Remember last time he was looking away from the skull. This time we see the red cloth, we see a tattered book, we see a lantern, and we see the quill. What is being said in this picture here? Well, once again, the red could be the, the love of Christ. It could be the earth. The, the skull is death, but now he's looking at it. What does that mean? Last time he was looking at heaven, now he's looking at the skull. This is interpreted as that when someone looks at the skull, it's impending death. He knows his death is coming. Now, the tattered book is very interesting. And we'll go to the next slide here because the tattered book tells you that he has not, finish his writings yet and we know that from the quill sitting there that he feels like he has not completed his work here on earth yet and death is coming the tattered and the quill last of all is a lantern here's the case where the lantern means wisdom remember i told you a while ago about the hourglass which was the resurrection <clears throat> if you were to see a picture where let's say a picture of a pope or someone and you had the lantern on one side and the hourglass on the other you have, the, you have the resurrection, and you have the wisdom or the knowledge. So anytime you see a lantern, uh, pretty much in uh, Christian artwork, it means going to mean uh, the wisdom. Now, there's going to be some exception, and that exception is right here in this picture because we have lots of things. This is called the Instruments of the Passion of the Christ, unknown uh, artists, but we see a lantern there. We see flask. Uh, that's not a fishing basket, <clears throat> but uh, we do see the red cloak. We see... Uh, pan looks like a cake pan to me but it's a pan we see money on there so what does all this mean so this is interesting because they break it all down for us and this is almost like a uh, cheat sheet of what images mean so i love this one here because it tells you so much so you got two flasks what do those flasks mean well it refers to the wine of the last supper the purse of course held the 30 pieces of silver uh, judas got the lantern uh and the halberd. Now, <clears throat> those represent the soldiers. Here's a case where the lantern is not with a person, and the person would have to be someone of knowledge to begin with. But here they're not with the person, so therefore the lantern has to match something else and is matching that halberd. The halberd is the one on the bottom. It's a sword on the bottom, which has kind of like a hammerish top to it. So that's what a soldier would have. So if you ever see that, that means they're a soldier. Now, number seven down here says the spear. See the spear laid on top of the halberd? A spear, just because you carry a spear, does not mean you're a soldier. That represents the piercing in Christ's side. <clears throat> now, we're seeing the robe, the crown of thorns. We're seeing the parchment, all these different objects in there. Uh, and then we see the brass pan, which I said looked like a cake pan, but actually that is Pilate's dish that he washes his hands with. And then you see the hammer, the dice, and the nails all together down there representing the actual crucifixion, the hammering uh, into Christ's hands and feet, and then uh, the of uh, the nails. And then we see, of course, the dice that they rolled to get the cloak. Now, let's take a few looks at just some expressions of Christ. First one here is called S. Homo, and this is referred to as the sorrowful expression of Christ, the, the expression of passion for us. This one here is, once again, it's called Christ's derision, and it's Christ being sorrowful, looking down. And then we have what's called the man of sorrow. Very strange picture, too. Uh, 1452 to 1549 is when uh, the artist lived. Kind of an interesting one. Once again, I want you to see here, he's wearing red. Remember this picture back here? He's wearing purple. Uh, purple for royalty. Red is for earth. This is interesting now because this is called the ridden, risen Christ. The hands, you can see, have the nails holes in it. You can see the halo. But what's interesting is we see a red cloak, which is interesting because if he is risen, he is no longer of the earth. He is should be wearing a blue cloak, wouldn't you think? But the artist decided to do a red cloak. Now we're seeing here the blessing. See the, the fingers? 
Uh, basically, very seldom you see anyone except for Christ with the blessing in the hand. And here you see the purple. And one of my favorite pictures, and this is uh, called Salvatore Mundi. And this is Christ holding the globe. You really can't tell it, but it said, you know, the whole world is in his hand. A very interesting picture of Christ, not the typical look that we see that Christ typically has. But you think that's an interesting look. When I was in Washington, D.C., I went to the Basilica of the National Shrine of Immaculate Conception. <clears throat> and this is at the Catholic University, University, the Catholic University in Washington, D.C., and 1847, so it was really not that tremendously old. But I'm going to give you a little education here. Immaculate conception is not the same as a virgin birth. You probably already know that. Virgin birth means that Mary was a virgin when she had Christ. Immaculate conception means that Mary was born without original sin. So that is what the Catholic Church put on Mary, is that she was born sinless. So therefore, she is has what we call the Immaculate Conception. As Protestants, uh, we do not see it that way, but that's what the Catholic Church does. So I want to point that out to you. In the main uh, area of the church, you see this wonderful looking uh, uh, area, and this is uh, the high altar. And you see that picture of Christ up there? I'm going to show you a closer picture of this, and there it is. <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? And what do you see here? Well, this is a picture of the people either love or they really don't like. I hate to say the word they hate, but that's sometimes what they say. It's 30 feet, 34 feet from hand to hand, has over 4,000 shades of color. This is probably no more than maybe about 75 years old. And the reason why people have problems with it is because Christ looks angry. He has fire coming out from his halo. Uh, he has blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, he looks very muscular, like he's mad. Uh, but other people see it, and they see in it a very wonderful sign. They see Christ as the all-powerful, that he controls everything, that nothing uh, can come in his way, that you have the most powerful thing in the universe on your side. So anyhow, just kind of a different interpretations. This is really a case where you, you look at it and you think, as I did too, looking at it, think, I don't understand that interpretation. But once again, you know, I understand different people see different things in it. Okay, you remember this picture? Okay, let's go back. We did your midterm. <clears throat> Didn't do so well, did we? <clears throat> so let's do our final exam. So if you want to, take a sheet of paper, write one to five, or maybe you can just remember this in your head. And we're going to go through. we got five questions. Each one is worth 20 points. And let's see how well you do. So the first question is, for 20 points, Mary and Jesus are seen with two familiar church fathers. They are Jerome and Augustine, but which one is which for 20 points? Question two, for 20 points, which of the church fathers is identified as a bishop and which church office does the other church father have? Question number three for 20 points. So what attributing might the odd-looking animal in the foreground of the left panel symbolize? Question four. What do the colors blue, red, green, uh, I'm sorry, blue, red, and white in Madonna's and Jesus' clothing, clothing represent? And question five in the res, uh, crucifixion scene. Why is Mary in blue? Mary Magdalene's in red, and John is in blue and red. Let's go a little bit against what we've kind of seen, but, you know, put some thought to it for a second. You ready? Let's see what the answers are. Question number one. Well, Jerome is to the left. Augustine is to the right. How do we know that? Because Augustine is a bishop, as in question two. And the bishop has a mitre hat, and remember, he has a gold robe. In this case, he has a burgundy. Remember, you have a gold or burgundy. He has a burgundy, but he has gold in the robe and the gold trim. So that tells us between that and the gold mitre hat that he is the bishop. And, of course, he's carrying the staff. Jerome is to the left. How do we know that? Because he has the red robe. The bishops wear a very bright red. Where I'm sorry, the cardinals wear the very bright red where the bishops wear more of a burgundy. So he has a bright red, and you see underneath his hand where he's holding the church, he has the cardinal's hat to it. And you probably figured out that question number three for 20 points, that that is the lion. If you remember, 
that Jerome pulled the thorn out of the lion's paw and the lion became his protector. So maybe you got that one correct. Probably got several of those correct. Let's go to question number four. For 20 points, okay, what does the blue, red, and white in Madonna and Jesus represent? The blue represents heaven and truth. And I know it looks black, but actually very navy blue. The red signifies her love, her love for Jesus. Also represents what? It represents earth. So here we have, she was born of the earth, but she is heavenly. So remember, what is under what? That makes a big difference. The white that is purity and innocence, and that's her veil, and you can see there's a crown on top of that. Jesus, he's wearing what color? He's wearing blue, which represents heaven. So here's a case where you don't see Jesus in white, but you see him in blue, representing that he is heavenly. So here, again, you've got a situation where the artist is making it very clear that Jesus is divine. Mary is born of the earth, but in this artist's opinion, she becomes divine. Question number five, and the crucifixion scene up there in the top, we see Mary in blue. Okay, that's true. She stays in blue for her, for heaven and truth. We see Mary Magdalene. She is in red for the love of Christ. But what's interesting here, why is green not there? Well, the reason why green is not there is because green represents what? Represents the resurrection. Christ is being crucified. He is not resurrected yet. If this was after he was resurrected, Mary would be seen in the green. Remember that picture where she had the very nice silky clothes on, she had the green? That supposedly was a picture of Mary after the resurrection. However, we have seen some pictures where before the resurrection that she's wearing some green. So it, it gets a little confusing in there. But if you see someone in green, uh, you have to assume that that's probably Mary Magdalene. Now, what's John doing? John's typically always wearing red, but here he's wearing blue and red. And once again, look at how it's layered. The blue's on the bottom, the red's on top. This is very interesting because what he's sitting there saying is that he is heavenly, but he's not saying that he was divine like Christ, but it says that he had the heavenly spirit in him, but that he wore the red we don't know if it's for the earth or for his love for Christ. That was a little confusing. Okay, Other symbolism in here, too. You see some different things up there, but those were the primary ones I wanted you to see. So how did you do? Let's see how you did. So add up your score, and let's see. If you got 20 points, if you only got 20 points, well, oh, my goodness, maybe you need some medication, or maybe you just need your spouse to sit there and tell you, pay attention, watch the PowerPoint. You're looking off. Uh, so 20 points, but if you got 40 points, okay, you're doing much better, but I think you're probably multitasking. You're probably uh, watching TV while you're looking at this presentation. Maybe I don't know, watching Housewives at Houston or watching the football game. Okay, 40 points, okay, but 60 points. Now, in academic world, you have passed. Minimally, you have passed. So now you're qualified to teach art appreciation symbolism to pre-kindergarten, maybe kindergarten, but probably not too much above that. Of course, I'm having fun with you here. And 80 points, now you're getting pretty good. 80 points, you could probably fool most people and they could think that you're an expert in the knowledge of religious art and symbolism. But if you've made 100 points, you've got them all correct, guess what? Congratulations. You could be an art curator or a docent at the Vatican Museum in Rome. You're that good. So how do you learn more about all this? Well, here's a couple books. First one is How to Read a Painting, Lessons by the Old Masters. You can get these on Amazon, anywhere you want to. Uh, once again, I told you most of this presentation came out of me going to the Museum of the Bible and seeing how they actually laid it out and read their description. But at the same time, I took these two books too. And this How to Read the Painting does a great job not only religious art, all types of art, and tells you the different symbolism, tells you how to read it. It's a great kind of a read, kind of a reference book. The next one is called The Book of Symbols. Now, this does not have paintings in it, but is more explaining what symbolism is all about, like the helmet, uh, the pieces of silver, uh, the green fabric. This is where you find out, it tells you what lions and tigers and bears are like, you know, what they're, like, what they're all about. So this is probably a little bit more general, but it's also very interesting. Remember I told you about Mary Madeline had the flowing golden hair? Uh, remember I said that I thought she had red hair? If you were to read this book, you'll say red hair is wild. It shows that you are wild, you're uncontrollable. Kind of like David, okay? But the golden hair shows that you're devout, that you have moved to being devout and hopeful. Uh, gray hair, well, we know that is as wisdom. 
on that. So anyhow, two great books to look at. If you want to go look at some great Christian artwork, the Blanton Museum at University of Texas here in Austin, they have an exhibit, I believe it's permanent, and it is of Christian artwork. Most of it is from Central America and South America in the 1700s, 1800s. They do have some going back to the 1300s from Europe, but it's a great way to go in there. If you do, Write down some of these things that you've you've noticed here, like the red, the blue, the greens, the skull, the lantern, the uh, um, hourglass, and look for these things in the pictures. At the same time, before you read the description of the picture where it says this is a picture of St. Ambrose, take a look at it, see if you can figure it out, and chances are you probably can figure parts of it out on that. And if you really want to go and look at what I looked at, you've got to go all the way to Washington, D.C., get there before the end of September of 2020. And this that's where you can see this actual exhibit, these paintings, with the exact description that I gave you in even more detail. And if you haven't been to the Museum of the Bible, it's probably, to me, one of the greatest museums. I think it's probably one of the best museums in Washington, D.C., even better than the Smithsonian, because it shows you all the history of the canon, it tells you all about the New Testament, Old Testament, great interactive exhibits in their great artwork. I think you'll really enjoy that. Folks, that's it for today. I really appreciate your time. I hope maybe you learned something out of all of this here. And of course, I have to sit there and say thank you for sharing this time with me. And we'll talk to you again later.